When Apple announced their 2016 MacBook Pro, there was a huge uproar from the creative community. And not only people who typically hate on Apple, but even Apple users themselves that have been waiting for this redesign for a long time. This is the first time that I've seen this many people say that they're going to switch from Apple to Windows. In the last few years, Windows laptop manufacturers have really stepped up their game and have made some really nice, compelling machines, not only in pricing and specs, but also in design. I decided to take a look at two machines that in my opinion are closest to the MacBook Pro and look at not only specs and price, but their design, their performance, and an overall usability aspect. Now I'm also doing a video on video editing and comparing all the performances and stuff like that, so definitely go and check that out, but this is going to cover mainly the usability and the daily use case of these machines. If you want to see my video editing comparison, make sure you guys hit that subscribe button and enable notifications, and then check the video description to see if that video is up already. For this comparison, I have a $2,800 MacBook Pro with the base CPU, 512 SSDs, and 4GB 460 GPU. The Dell XPS is $2,500, and it's the only one with 32 gigs of RAM with a 2GB 960M graphics card. The Razer Blade is $2,000 with a 6GB GTX 1060 graphics card. Like you see, the prices do vary a bit, and some have better screens and more RAM than others. I wasn't able to get the exact variation of Windows machines that I would have wanted to because of availability, but if I could have, both Windows machines would have been about $2,300 with the Blade moving up to the QHD display and purchasing a Dell with 512 SSD and 16 gigs of RAM and upgrading it to 32 gigs by myself. Let's start out with the exterior. I really like the look of the MacBook Pro and the Blade. When the Dell is closed, it just looks like an old thick Windows machine. Once you open it, that infinity edge display takes over and it looks really nice. Even though the MacBook has thicker bezels than the XPS, they have shrunk from years before and aren't distracting since they are glossy black. The Razer Blade's bezels are ridiculously huge and being plastic look really bad. Razer could have fit a 15 inch display in here which would have been a big improvement for looks and usability. One thing to note is because of the bezels, the XPS webcam is at the bottom left corner, which isn't great for web chat. Initially, I wanted Apple to use the matte black color that they do on the iPhone 7 on the new MacBook Pros, but now that I've had a chance to play with the blade, I really like the space gray. The black has a less premium look, but also attracts a crazy amount of fingerprints that are hard to get rid of. The Dell is covered with a soft touch coating that feels great but also attracts oils, but stays much cleaner longer and is easier to clean than the blade. In regards to build quality, almost every reviewer agrees that the MacBook Pro is the best built laptop. It's completely made out of metal, including the hinge, and the attention to detail is astonishing. From the ease of opening up the screen, which Apple talks about, to the intake ports on the side, it's an amazing design. The machine feels solid while being the thinnest and lightest out of the bunch. I was expecting the Blade to come in second with its copy of the MacBook design, but I was wrong and I have to give second place to the Dell XPS. It's made mostly of aluminum and has less flex in the metal and plastic, but it could also be because it's the thickest and the heaviest. Dell even included a magnetic serial number cover to make the machine look nicer. The Blade is third with more flex in the metal and the plastic feels cheap and actually moves around and makes noise when touched. With that said, these Windows machines are the cream of the crop and are both nice. I really like that the XPS has a battery meter on the side, but it also has an LED indicator in the front, which is possibly why they didn't have a cutout to make it easier to open the laptop. That, combined with the really resistant hinge that helps with touchscreen usage, makes it a big pain when you open up the machine. The thicker display needed for the touchscreen, as well as the really thick aluminum sheets Dell uses, makes the XPS really top heavy. You can see when using it on your lap, it actually leans back and if you use a touchscreen, it wobbles back and forth, which isn't an issue for the other two. After lots of use, I only found myself occasionally using the touchscreen when scrolling web pages. If you like using a touchscreen on a Windows laptop, I'm really curious to know what some of your guys' uses are, so please let me know in the comment section below. Finishing off with design, both Windows machines have intake ports at the bottom. The XPS looks like it has a long port, but only the sections above the fans are actually intake ports. This isn't an issue when used on a desk, but using them on my lap, these ports are right where my legs are and get blocked, causing the machine to heat up faster and kick up the fans. The Mac has intake ports on the side so they don't get blocked and the system runs silent and cool even when you use it on your lap. Talking about cooling, the Razer Blade's fans are always spinning and audible, and after owning several MacBooks, this is annoying and likely uses more battery as well. Both the Dell and Mac are virtually silent at idle. 
All the machines stay relatively cool under load thanks to their Skylake processors. That's if the window machine ports aren't blocked. The MacBook Pro is actually the quietest, possibly because of the fans they use have alternating thin angles, which they say reduces noises. And on top of that, the graphics card uses less power than the other two. The Razer Blade is the loudest laptop, even in its quiet fan mode. When you set it to the better cooling mode, it gets crazy loud, but the low temps only go down by a few degrees, so it's not worth it. For some reason, the Dell speakers are at the bottom. When it's on a desk, it's not a big of a deal because the sound does bounce up, but when it's on your lap, it can get muffled. The other two have top firing speakers, but other than that, they don't compare. Apple machines have always been at the very top with sound quality, and this generation, they got even better. The Razer Blade speakers sound good, but they're super quiet. If I'm in a room like this, then that's fine, but if I'm at home and I have my kids running around, or I have some background noises like the TV, even set to quiet, it's really hard to understand uh, watching a YouTube video, and it's too quiet to watch a movie or anything like that. The MacBook Pro speakers have the best sound quality, they're really loud, and you don't have to worry about them being blocked. Let's take a listen to a sound comparison test of these machines, but do keep in mind that this is the optimal situation for the Dell XPS. The speakers are actually closer to the microphone and they bounce off of the desk perfectly right up to the mic where the MacBook Pros and the Razer Blade speakers are firing up. Moving on to displays, I hated the Blade screen so much that I didn't want to use it even for gaming where it was a champion with its GTX 1060 graphics card. 14 inches sounds like not much smaller than Apple's 15.4, but in actual usability the Blade is frustrating. That's because Apple uses taller displays instead of sticking to 16 by 9. This made me realize how much more vertical space matters on these small displays. Apple's 12-inch MacBook actually has about the same vertical space as a 14-inch Razer Blade. When you're editing video or web browsing, an extra inch of horizontal space means almost nothing. Apple's 13-inch MacBook has more vertical resolution and just a bit less of horizontal space than the Blade 14. For video editing, the Razer Blade screen was frustrating, and even though the XPS screen is also 16x9, moving up to 15.6 inches makes a world of a difference. The Dell's 4K display is really nice. It's the highest resolution of the bunch and is also glossy, so everything looks extra sharp. The color accuracy is a bit better than the MacBook, and it's also a touchscreen. The only thing it lacks is brightness. It's rated 400 nits, but most testers said it's closer to 300. The MacBook Pro is rated at 500 nits, and it's one of the brightest screens in any laptop, being noticeably brighter than the Dell. This isn't a big deal inside, but if you work outside or work by windows, you'll have issues with the reflections, where the 2016 MacBook Pro can get bright enough to combat that. Moving on to keyboard, the MacBook Pro uses Apple's second generation butterfly keys, which are a huge step up from the first generation and the 12 inch Retina MacBook. Most reviewers agree that you can get used to them and type fast and accurately. And some even love this design more than the much praised older style, myself being included. They feel like mechanical key switches, but with much less travel. What makes them usable is the clickiness and pushback you get from the keys, and the extra large design with slightly concave tops. I was surprised how good the Blade keyboard was, and I typed on it just as fast and accurately as on the MacBook. The XPS keys were disappointing. It would not register some of my key presses, probably because I would hit the edges of the keys. This also reduced my typing speed and accuracy to about 40 words per minute, compared to 65 with the Mac and the Blade. All three keyboards are backlit, with the Blade and Mac being individually backlit with almost no backlight bleed. The Blade features Razer's chroma lighting with an incredible amount of customization if you're into that, but we didn't mess with it. The Dell uses an older style that doesn't look as nice, but does the job. One huge disappointment is how the Razer Blade handles shortcuts. The Dell allows you to adjust all your settings by hitting the keys without holding down the function button. Older Macs do this as well, but of course this one has an OLED touch bar, so that's not an issue. 
the blade forces you to hold down the function button to use any of your shortcuts, which is a pain since those are used much more than your standard function keys. What's worse is none of these shortcuts are backlit. This means in the dark, it's basically impossible to see what keys need to be hit to change your brightness, volume, backlighting, etc. This was a huge pain. Moving on to the controversial touch bar, is it a gimmick? Well, yes and no. I do find it more useful than the touch screen as you can customize what shows up and get extra shortcuts and features that you wouldn't get on the screen. The things that show up are meant to be there, so it works well instead of using your finger on a touch screen with the UI being mostly designed for a mouse. Now with that said, most of the time you're looking at your screen and not down at your keyboard. I've gotten used to doing some of the functions without looking, like adjusting brightness and music control, and I do like the scrubbing function and some of the shortcuts in Final Cut X, but most things in Final Cut can be mapped to the keyboard. I do find it useful for spelling suggestions because I'm a bad speller, and it's much quicker to just tap on the correct word instead of using your mouse to right click and select the correct spelling. And yes, I have now started to use emoji. Honestly, it's not a make it or break it feature, but Touch ID is so nice to have for passwords and Apple Pay. I found myself often trying to press the top right section of the Windows machines because of just muscle memory and it working so well on the MacBook, and once I even shut down the Dell XPS because that's exactly where its power button is. The MacBook features an absolutely huge touchpad and I love it. Just like with the keyboard, Macs are known for their excellent touchpads and this one doesn't disappoint. While I thought it to be a bit excessive at first, now I love using it for gestures, and in my month and a half, I've only had three times the palm rejection failed, where the Dell XPS's much smaller touchpad has had at least 10 in the month I've used it. The Mac touchpad is completely solid like the blades, but because of its haptic touchpad, you can control how hard of a press you want it to simulate. Because of this, you can use forced touch gestures and have an equal clicking feel anywhere on the trackpad, with right clicks being done with two fingers. The blade could have really used the haptic feedback, since it doesn't allow you to click down and you have to use the left or right click buttons, which is a pain, or constantly double tap. I also found the tracking performance to be worse than the other two. If I owned the Blade 14, I would have to keep a wireless mouse with me at all times. The XPS trackpad is rated well for a Windows trackpad, but after using Macs for years, it also disappoints. The tracking is mostly okay, but it's weird at times, and you do have the ability to click down on the trackpad to click, but the feel changes depending on where you're at. Two sides are separated for right and left clicks, and I did find myself often accidentally right clicking. The MacBook Pro features four Thunderbolt 3 ports that can do almost anything. It works perfectly with my new display and sends and receives data, audio, and a 5K video signal while charging the laptop at full power at the same time. I've connected the Blade and XPS to the display, but they only support 4K at this time, which may change in the future. The Dell XPS does accept charging through its USB-C port, but it's only about half the speed compared to its power brick because it does take more power than the MacBook Pro does. This means that it will still work for a one-cable desktop setup, but if you're doing intensive tasks, the machine's battery will drain slowly. The Razer Blade, on the other hand, has USB charging completely disabled, which really sucks. This means that you'll always have to get out your power brick for a desktop setup. And what sucks even more is you can't use a battery bank to charge up or supplement your battery power when on the go, which is an amazing feature of USB-C. Having only four USB Type-C ports could be a pain for now, but for me, it's not a huge deal. Most of my external accessories and drives have detachable cables, so I bought a few new cables that are under $10, and I usually don't need to use an adapter. The two devices I have with an attached cable do need a $9 adapter, or you can use this $40 hub that allows you to charge, read SD and micro SD cards, and have two USB 3 ports. The MacBook Pro and the Razer Blade both lack SD card readers, which is really a pain, while the Dell XPS does have an SD card reader along with two USB 3 ports. The Blade has three standard USB ports and both Windows machines come with HDMI and a single Thunderbolt 3. Even though only having USB-C ports for now is a pain, but in the future, in about one to two years, most of the devices will be shipping with USB-C, and if you have a machine that only has one USB-C port, like these two Windows machines, you'll likely need to be buying an adapter to go from uh, USB-C cables to standard USB plugs. Now let's talk battery life. The MacBook Pro got a lot of hate when it first launched, and for good reason. In order to make this machine thinner, Apple lowered the battery from 99.5 kWh to about 75, and the Skylake processor and graphics card isn't that much more efficient than last year's. 
Many users were complaining about battery life being in the range of 5 to 6 hours compared to 8 with their previous generation MacBook Pro, and that's the results that I had myself. A few weeks after launch, Apple updated their operating system and removed the battery life indicator, which raised a lot of eyebrows. But with that, they actually improved the battery life, and many users said they got an hour to about an hour and a half better battery life, and that's what I noticed. Now, with light tasks, I get about seven hours of battery life, which is about right for a battery this size uh, and the processor and graphics card that are in this machine. With that said, Windows laptops are known for overestimating battery life. The Dell has the largest battery with 84 kilowatt hours for this model, and Dell rates it at up to 17 hours, but that's with the screen very dim and without the 4K display. Most reviewers said they got about 5 hours of actual light usage with this machine. Now I also have to mention that there's also two different battery packs. The machine I have has the larger one, but there are some that support a standard hard drive as well, so that extra space makes it have a smaller battery. So when you're buying it, make sure that you get the one with the 84 kilowatt hour battery. The Razer Blade has the smallest battery at 70 kilowatt hours, and if you search online, there are so many people complaining of only four hours of battery life with the screen being dim. I ran my own tests, which consisted of streaming a YouTube video playlist of 4K video. The blade died after two hours and 11 minutes, and the XPS lasted two hours and 45 minutes. The MacBook lasted six hours and 56 minutes. This is with all the laptops at the same brightness, with the MacBook being at about 30%. I didn't change anything with the Mac, but made sure that Windows machines were set to balance power mode. Now the only way this really makes sense is if the Windows laptops are using their dedicated graphics cards instead of the built-in Intel HD 530. Now remember, all three of these machines have the same exact processor and the same built-in graphics, which they should be using for light tasks like this. My guess is that they said, wow, this is 4K video, uh, the operating system or the software on the Windows side is saying, hey, we should use the dedicated graphics to make sure it's smooth, um, or maybe just inefficiencies. I, I really just don't know, but the actual battery life distance the differences are just crazy, kind of mind-blowing. Now, along with these uh, battery-saving things, like where I had it in balanced power mode, maybe I should have you know, switched it to battery saving mode, but it really is a pain on the Windows side. On the Mac, you don't have to adjust anything. On the Windows side, you have all these different options for power saving, the Windows, then there's Dell's own assistant, then there's Nvidia's assistant for the graphics card, then there's uh, the assistant for uh, the Intel built-in graphics. It really gets ridiculous how much, if you wanna get the most, how much things you need to know, and, and you do have different uh, third party uh, kind of uh, programs or, or assistance that can also help lower your CPU speed to get battery life, where on the Mac side, all you really have to do is just use the machine and it chooses um, if it wants to save battery or if you need more performance, it'll give you full performance. And I had issues with the Windows machines getting full performance as well because it tried to save battery life. And I'll talk about that more in the, uh, the video editing video, but it really is a much more frustrating experience on the Windows side. The last thing that I want to cover is the operating system, so I'm not going to get too much into this, but I've been using Windows for a very long time, since I built my first uh, Windows custom PC, which was 16 years ago, right when Windows XP launched. I've only used MacBooks for the past uh, maybe three years, and I honestly like the operating system way better. It's simple to use, you have a lot less drivers issues and crashes, and it just it's a much more enjoyable experience myself. On the Windows side, uh, when I launched, when I got these computers and I opened them up, uh, the Windows machines took about 30 minutes to set up. You're waiting, you're doing settings, you're waiting again. On the MacBook, you open it up and now it turns on by itself. 10 minutes later, I'm running, I'm using the machine. Now, along with that, I had a lot of different drivers and software issues on the Windows side. So for example, on the Razer Blade, as soon as it launched into Windows, I started having uh, actual driver crashes, and I was able to fix those with some driver updates. With the Dell XPS, I couldn't launch any games because it said I needed to update uh, my NVIDIA drivers. And the NVIDIA Assistant said I was completely up to date, so I had to manually go on the website, download it, and install it, which is usual. I mean, if you know Windows, you kind of have to do those kind of things. But it really is frustrating where on the Mac side, there's not very many updates that come up, and most updates are installed in the background. So whenever you restart the computer, it's nice, quick, easy, and you're done. And a lot of updates actually don't even need a re reinstall. 
Now, to get even more weird, with the Razer Blade, when I got the system, it actually wouldn't right click. So as soon as you'd right click, it kind of freeze up the system for a few minutes. And then you'd wait, right click again, it would freeze it up. And that was the first week of my usage with that computer. It was very frustrating. Now, I had, after that, I had a Windows update, which took about 30 minutes to install, and that fixed it. I was able to right click, but then my start button and my search options did not work. You click it, nothing shows up. So a few days after that, I got another Windows update. It took another 20 to 30 minutes to install that when I restarted. And well, guess what? My Windows and search button started working but my right clicking stopped working again. I didn't have this on the, on the XPS, but this one on the Razer Blade, and it's just frustrating. It really is frustrating. When you do get an update, like the battery life update uh, for the MacBook Pro, it downloads in the background, and it took less than 10 minutes to install, and it was an actual operating system revision, and it was, I was up and going and everything was fine. So just the whole driver's issues and stuff like that is a lot worse on the Windows side. Now, when the MacBook Pro first launched, some people were having graphics issues, and Apple said it was, gra it was uh, graphics drivers related. Now, I personally didn't have these issues, uh, but people just went crazy and made headlines. The MacBook's graphics cards aren't working, and people just aren't used to that on the Macs, and when it does happen, they blow it way out of proportion, where on the Windows side, people are used to uh, drivers going wrong and you having to update, update stuff, do stuff manually. Um, I bought an Acer machine once, and it had really bad audio issues, and I called them for support, and they're like, well, yeah, don't you know you need to go to this website and download this, and it was just a huge step for a person for a person that actually knows what they're doing, and they kind of expected you to know this and to do it, where on the Apple side, it just works a lot better because they're controlling the software and the hardware. Overall, the last month was a good experience for me, and it was a big reminder on why I love MacBooks. It's not only the specs that matter, because the Windows machines are faster for the money, but the overall Mac experience is much better on the laptop side. MacBooks are more expensive, but not by that much if you're comparing it to a similar Windows machine with good build quality and thinness. I've been suggesting Windows laptops for Premiere Pro editors for quite a while now, and I'll continue to do so because you do get better performance for the money, and that really matters when you're video editing, especially if you use Premiere Pro, which isn't very optimized. But for those who want not only a good video editing experience, but also a good overall experience, and you can afford a MacBook, I think it's a better machine. If you're going to switch over to Windows, instead of upgrading to a new MacBook Pro, I would suggest the XPS. Yes, I don't think it's as good as a Mac, but compared to most Windows options, it's a great machine. You get a great screen, good port options, and for less money than the MacBook Pro. It's noticeably heavier and thicker than the MacBook, but if you're coming from a 2015 or older MacBook Pro, it shouldn't be a huge change. I do want to mention that I tried to keep my mind open when I was uh, using these machines for the last month and tried to be as unbiased as possible. I do use Final Cut, which means I have to use a Mac, but I tried to totally forget that, and while writing up this whole script and all my thoughts, I literally just hit me again that I have to use a MacBook Pro, but I really enjoy the overall experience if we don't even look at video editing. Now on the video editing side, I did compare these machines using uh, Premiere Pro, so definitely go and check out that video, and if it's not up yet, hit that subscribe button with notifications so you guys don't miss out on that video. And uh, The Windows machines do perform better, but they do have some quirks and some annoyances in the video editing side as well that you probably should know if you're considering buying one of them, so definitely check out that video. Along with that, if you guys have any questions, you guys can ask them in the comment section below. I will do my very best to answer them. And if you guys enjoy the video and appreciate all the time that it took to make this, and trust me, it took a lot of time and it did take money, please uh, hit that like button. And if you guys want to support us, for just $2 a month, you can make more videos possible and better quality, more entertaining videos possible. And there's also extra perks with the different tiers, like exclusive videos, early releases with ads disabled, and other really nice bonuses that you guys should check out. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate all the people that are supporters already. Thank you guys so much. So uh, thanks for watching this video. And I'm going to have links to these exact machines in the video description. So you guys can go and check those out. Let me know your thoughts. I definitely want to hear them. And I will see you in the next video.